the Around the NFL podcast. Worldwide football pants. Welcome to another edition of the Around the NFL podcast. I'm Greg Rosenthal, stepping in for one day in the host chair for Dan Hansis. In a room filled with one hero, Mark Sessler, that room being the Chris Wrestling Podcast Studio. But Mark. Yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's uh, always tough not to have Dan with us. Um, but it's like, I think the toughest part is, again, I get put in this seat where I, <laughs> like, my body feels awkward. I don't know what to do, but I'm... Your body looks good. Your body looks good. All of our bodies, considering we're, we're getting older, is looking <laughs> good. Um, I can say the same about our guests, and it's rare we just go right into it. But this is an important man at our company. Um, he's so important, actually. He insisted that Dan and him not do the show together. And right. we thought, we thought like, that's, that's like a lot to ask. That's kind of diva behavior. Um, but he's that important at draft time that we're going to welcome in Daniel Jeremiah, move the sticks. Thank you, Daniel, for joining uh, us. Well, first of all, uh, this is Garofolo. Colin, what is, what is, what is he? Well, I'll call him back later. Um, <laughs> two, two things. Number one, I had two, uh, conditions for me to come on this show. One, Dan's not there. That's a given, right? I, I, he's there. I'm out. That's done. Yeah. The other condition was I said, here's the thing. I'll do it. First of all, I love Sessler. So I'm happy to do it for Sessler. If I'm going to, if I'm going to work with Greg though, I need him to dress up like Fonzie. If he dresses like Fonzie, <laughs> it's funny. Then I, I'll come on. I I'll just like kind of took off my jacket. It was a little hot in here. Yeah. And I thought, what are the odds that Jeremiah doesn't mention this <laughs> <laughs> Almost right away. So you've made me self-conscious. And uh, this is why we're getting such big numbers on YouTube is action yeah. like this. You can actually watch me now. Uh, so Does anybody watching on YouTube jacket. even know who Fonzie is? Uh, I <laughs> not at this point. Not case. at this point. And I've, I feel like I've escaped your ire for a, a decade plus, And I appreciate that. Um, it feels yeah. sincere. But you have incredible power to um, remove Dan from the seat and also alter Greg's wardrobe. That These things are not easily done. Yeah, I just lost money on the fact that that's not a leather jacket that he that he <laughs> draped over his white shirt. So I lost that bet. It's uh, it's DJ's time of year. I'm sure you're thrilled yeah. because we're taping this uh, Thursday, exactly one week away from the NFL draft. And it's it's a long process here for Jeremiah. I mean, no one no one's crying for you here, but you no, you switch straight from the Chargers into cranking these players out, and now you're you're only one week away. What do you? What is your like uh, post draft? plan you have to work for one more week and then what happens i've shortened it down i used to um the draft would end and then literally would uh work the next day and work that entire week we would do path to the draft mm -hmm. very ironically named after the draft <laughs> for a week uh for a week afterwards and then over the years that got shortened till okay just you can just work till thursday we'll give you that friday off and then you're you're free to the point now where I, I only have to do that first day. So I think mm. I do the Monday show and then that's it. So uh, I get a little bit of a break, but it's kind of weird. And you guys know with kids, like I still have uh, two in the house and then they, you know, they're still in school. So everybody's like, Oh, do you go on vacation? What do you do after? I'm like, nothing. I'm just sitting at home, <laughs> like looking at baseball box scores and trying to figure out if I'm going to run on the treadmill or ride the bike. Like that's, that's the, uh, that's what's going on. I think what you should tell us at least cook up some sort of misadventure that makes us think, you know, Daniel Jeremiah is at the, the forefront of uh, personal experience post. -work. He's listening to eighties R and B. He's watching the Padres. Nothing uh, could make him happy. I'm going I'm to start uh, my questions here, DJ, by putting yeah. you in the minds of all 32 GM. So this is a world where you're actually running every team but you can't oh, make trades because you'd be trading with yourself. This is, it's a scary world to think about, but if, yeah. you, if you were the GM of every team, who is the first team you would take Brock Bowers for? Cause the closer we get to this draft, like the more I'm just fascinated by him as a player and his discussion and value and all that, like, which is the first team if it was your team and we know, hey, look, yeah. some of these teams, you know, they, they sprinkle around interest. Maybe someday when the kids are older, DJ Willie will, will be working for a team. Which team are you taking Bowers with? Um, this is going to, this is saying this as somebody who has him rated very highly, um, like maybe seven or eight, I think on my list, somewhere around there. The first team where I would personally take him with my team would be 15 with the Indianapolis Whoa. Colts. So, and that's for, you know, different reasons. There's not needs for some of these teams at that position. 
Then there's teams that have, you know, you know, golly, you've got, if you're, if you're picking right before them, the New Orleans Saints have to take a tackle. Like they've painted themselves into a corner here. They can't do this penning. They can't do penning anymore. They can't try that. I mean, they are, they're not even trying to do it now. They, they, they'd rather play like their fourth string tackle than him. And then ramp check's going to be done. So like they have no, they have to, they have to take a tackle. So, and then you look at, you know, I see the, I see the Broncos twice a year, you know, uh, they they have functional tight ends. They have other needs um, jets? that they can address. Yeah, the, I, I thought so you'd that, throw the Jets in there. I, I thought that too. That, that so would be... I I I to me with the Jets, I go I go a couple of different ways. I I to me, Roma Dunze is the home run pick. Like I never thought in a million years in that draft that Garrett Wilson would get to him with their second pick. I thought it was going to be a decision, and I had them touching each other on my list, which was Sauce Gardner or Garrett Wilson. Can't go wrong. You're going to get one. No way you get both. And then somehow it, mm. it happened with Garrett Wilson falling her lap. So I won't rule it out that somehow um, after everything went against them last year in terms of uh, of good fortune, that maybe they get that good fortune that they had that draft and somehow Roma Dunze is there. I would take Rome uh, over Bowers. And then it comes down to, well, if it's Bowers versus the tackles, I've been saying I have, and I would have a higher grade on Bowers than the, than the second rated tackle. But I, you know, in having some conversations over the last 24 hours, one of the things that was brought to my mind was if you don't look at him as a tackle, like if you look at Fuaga or Fatanu as guys who can play different spots for a team that has been so, you know, so hit with injuries, to have them, I think either one of those guys, in my opinion at least, they beat out John Simpson right away and they start at guard. Mm. And then if Tyron Smith, some might say when um, he gets hurt, you have one of these guys that can, you know, now he can kick out and play tackle. So when I stop looking at him strictly as just a tackle, but saying, okay, I can still get him on the field right now, while also gives me a little bit of insurance for these two 33 year old tackles. That's why I, I bypass Bowers there as the Jets. Mm, interesting. Uh, you know, I, I found it um, enjoyable and intriguing to watch you and Mel Kuyper uh, in, 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 you know, headshots next to each other talking about these picks. Um, I mean, I grew up Mel Kuyper. We all did. Like, so it was kind of Oh, yeah, He's the guy. Yeah, and it's just like, I mean, at this point, I think people have turned him into almost a caricature, and it's like he's still grinding and doing all this. So I, when it I watch, I, I look at one player, because you guys brought up Michael Penix Jr., and I, I believe you had him at about 13, going around 13, yeah. and Kuyper has him all the way down at 37. We had Chad Ryder in here yesterday who had him, the Raiders trading up for him, but in the second round taking Carolina's pick. So it's like, this is a quarterback. I know those are the top four, but this guy seems to be all over the map. Why is there, I don't know, beyond the injury history, what is the disparity between you, Kuyper, and mm. person X and Y and Z? So here's the here's the fascinating part about that. And first of all, I'm glad you brought that up about Mel because I think, uh, you know, he's got the voice, he's got the hair, he's got the iconic moment, uh, you know, the flashback, the mailman, the whole, the whole thing, right? I think people need to... Uh, put a little bit more respect on the work that he does. Like he puts in a ton of work and you can't fake it. It's one thing that I've learned, you know, obviously from the scouting side, but then well, you coming do. over to this you side of it, you can't it. fake it. Yeah. it. Listen, listen to people when they're talking about players. <laughs> and and when you hear people reference, when I watched him against Notre Dame, when, when I saw that, like they're referencing moments of the work that they've done mm. versus some pluralities and generalities that can get tossed around that I can pick up a, you know, the stats and look at him and I can give you that. Like he, the guy works hard. He we, really does. We do and, fake it, um, Daniel. And it's, fi you, oh, nice. it's, it's fine. Nice. Like but the show, the show is doing 99% well. of the people yeah. won't know. Yeah. That's it's the whole thing. Like, Oh, what is the huge difference between Fashanu, uh, Fuaga and Fawatanu? Like, um, yeah. we'll get back to you on that next time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I did want to make that point about Mel because I love him and he is a, literally like I, he is a sweetheart of a man. Like he is such a nice guy who treats people really, really well. So anyways, the, outside of that, the Penix. So Mark, I have Penix as I think my 34th rated player, hmm. but I had him going 13th and I think that confuses people. And so I try to explain it the best the way that I can. I, there's taking players where you have them rated, but then there's also like, let's have some common sense here and this if we're going to all agree as we i'm sure we do the quarterback is the most important position on your team and it's going to be the biggest indicator whether or not you're going to be successful or not if you're the raiders i couldn't get by this point of saying 
yes, he's my 34th player. Some of that's injuries, you know, factoring into that. Um, but I have Gardner Minshew and I have Aiden O'Connell. Sure. Is he better than what I have at the most important position? Yes. Mm. He is infinitely more talented. Like that's not debatable. Um, it's not even mm. close. So if I, uh, man, I can say, well, I have this player rated that higher, higher, that player rated higher. Well, me upgrading a tackle or me upgrading, you know, a corner. Is that the same as me? I can upgrade the, the quarterback position here. Like, don't you have to consider that? And that's why I have the 34th player on my board going with the 13th pick. Makes sense. It does make sense. And you could see, look, I, I don't think it's crazy to imagine him slipping to the second or late first. No, and, no. And then, they, and then, they, and then they get in the mix for all. him there. Or they just stick with their two picks and they get him in the second. We've, we've just seen yeah. that very often. And if he's the fifth quarterback, let's say, or the sixth uh those guys do fall far farther than people think. I want to get more to the top quarterback because I, I want to ask you, I have my takes. I have a theory on this, but I want to hear yours, yeah. yours first um, because I know how you like to steal my takes. Um, what Jade- is happening here, DJ? I'm so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I know. Mark, look, your, your place is secure on my, on my board. Okay. You don't need to even chime in on that. Jaden Daniels or Drake may just which evaluation is harder. Um, that's a good point. So, they're 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 equal because okay. you're trying to evaluate one guy for what he doesn't have and evaluate the other guy for an excess of riches um, in terms of of what they're playing with. And you know, so the the thing that's that I look at is I've seen I've seen Drake May, you know, with a lesser cast last year than what Jaden Daniels had this year, play at a really high level. Um, with just a with a with a solid B level supporting cast, I've seen him play at a really high level. Now his supporting cast this year was terrible, and his play you know took a dip, and it wasn't all their fault. He got some mechanical things out of whack. His delivery got a little bit long. He wasn't quite as firm with his feet. Like there was things that he 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 let go a little bit. With Jaden Daniels, I have you know all these other years of him playing at kind of just a ho hum mediocre level and then this year skyrockets with you know a unbelievable supporting cast but i also look at it and say i saw even though he had more playing experience than burrow i saw burrow take off like a rocket ship when it just all clicked when they put an offense in place that matched his abilities he exploded and took off so i'm not dismissing what Jaden did uh by any stretch but uh, i am more forgiving of drake and i think you always look in the past to try and help predict the future and at least Mm. at least from a theory standpoint and when i look at you know josh allen from his second to last year to his final year and the regression that took place as the erosion of the supporting cast it it was awful i looked at jordan love the exact same situation Mm. the year before at utah state i watched him and i was like yeah this guy's gonna be great can't wait to watch him the next year the next year they were terrible and he was terrible so I've seen those guys. It, it, in other words, I've seen Drake may do it. I know he can do it. Right. And he's a bigger guy. He's more physical. Um, I've seen him throw with anticipation. I've seen him work in the in the mud in the middle of the field. I, I've seen him create things when pressure comes. Like, so I I don't get beholden to what's the last thing I saw in the last year. It's more of a body of work, and that's why I ended up with Drake May over Jaden Daniels. Sorry, it's a word salad there, but it is kind no, of tricky. No, I think it's the most fascinating thing in the draft, especially for for basics like us on some level. That like, I my theory is May is easier because you've seen yeah. him be in a tough spot and you've seen him yep. do such high level stuff. When I went and I went back and. Yeah, the quarterbacks are the most exciting thing for, for me to watch, certainly. And it's like, you see it all. And even this year, when you watch his stuff this year, it's like, did he take that big a step back? I, I hear you that he like misses, he misses throws more no, than... He than misses you, some layups. Right, you, That's what more, he than, more than you would yeah. want. But he also has a consistency where every single game, even this year, he's doing stuff that wows you. You can see him as a red zone beast. I love the guys that you mentioned, Allen and Love, because that's the same sort of type of prospect. He reminds me of just that. He's just physically just who wouldn't want to work with that. And you love them both. You have five and six, but to me, Daniels is extremely hard to evaluate because people get on McCarthy that he never, you know, he didn't have to do much. Didn't have to throw the ball. It's like Jaden Daniels threw the ball 325 times this year. Uh, He wasn't that highly thought of of a prospect till his last like half season of five seasons. 
and he's surrounded yeah. by great players. I, I think it was you or it was Mina, it was you and Mina that mentioned the RG3 comp, and that's really stuck in my head oh, since. And yeah. not as like a negative, because RG3 was extremely accurate. You saw how well he fit with Shanahan, and look, he outplayed Andrew Luck as a rookie. He, no. it, it wasn't like he was a bad prospect, but he reminded, Jaden Daniels reminds me of him, which I, I find it kind of hard that he, he gets pressure on him, and then he just, he just goes, which is not mm. necessarily what you want, right, in, at the NFL, that like he doesn't stick, stick there and, and throw a lot under pressure. Yeah, that's it's kind of one or the other, you know. And to me, even as a runner, he reminded me of RG3 in that he's kind of a narrow frame guy who's extremely fast, but is not super elusive and who takes shots. Um, right. I think it was was it Haloti that broke his leg? I think it was Haloti who hit him at RG3 and, and right. ended up, um, breaking his leg. I mean, May anyway. takes shots too, to be fair, but he's bigger. But he's just sturdier, <laughs> yeah. dude. Um, so you know that's. That's what I struggle with a little bit, but he is he is a really good thrower. Like I've mm -hmm. uh, I was texting with uh, Ben Kurt about it, who's you know I, I love the fact we have so many people that are like watching these guys and putting their opinions out there. I think it's great. I think it's fun discussion, but I you know I, I try to communicate with as many people as I can. And uh, we were having a, a little a chat about it, and I said you know mechanically he looks like a he looks like a really skinny C.J. Stroud just in terms of mm. posture. Feet in the ground, throwing the ball accurately, you know, touch, drive. You can do all those things. But Stroud, and we saw it in in samples in college, and then saw it in bulk uh, with the Texans. Has he is just more? He's just more creative and more natural in terms of when things when he's getting moved around and making things happen. Um, and I just didn't see Jaden quite like that. I mean, this draft has uh, it's every draft has their own characteristics, and it's like very quarterback heavy. And the wide receiver class, I, I'm, it may be possibly unprecedented. But then on the flip side, I, I was driving down from uh, my place today listening to you and Bucky do your all-defensive mock draft where you've got to pick 32 defensive players and ignore all those guys. Oh, it's brutal. I, 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 it was almost comical brutal. because you got to about pick nine, and it's like you were uh -oh. doing it live. and you were I like, listened to that yeah. weeks ago, DJ, because I'm more of just like a real, you know, this is why fan. This is yeah. why we need Greg in the host chair, not yeah. Dan, because we get that kind of, <laughs> kind of yeah, self-effacing self you know, gold. When, when he's out there working on the motorbike, he likes right. to throw on just, the Yeah, I'm just saying I didn't yeah. cram at the does. last, you know, I was, I'm, I'm Well, I like, to, I like to keep it fresh, but I just, I do find it interesting because I can't remember a draft like this where like, you you basically said it's going to be an S show when you get, you get down to the mid 20s. <laughs> and you guys yeah. were really struggling to even try to find fits for what the team needs were. And it's like, mm. have you seen a defensive draft like this where the first round talent um, maybe withers away as quick as it does? No. And that's why uh, I was curious on that exercise, how it would go. Because offensively, I mean, we finished the first round with 32 offensive players. And I'm like, dude, I got six more receivers mm. I could have. Now, I can justify taking, you know, here if we were to extend this out into the second round. And then defensively, it's like, holy crud, like, what are we doing here? Like, this is not a first round hmm. player. Um, so that's it was a it was a healthy exercise, which to me can inform some decisions and could push up some of these defensive players. Like I've I've been saying over the last couple of days, like Byron Murphy to me from Texas, the defensive tackle who is the best interior disruptor and pass rusher in this draft, I think it's going to go higher than people think. I, I, I think there's a premium on that. I was talking to a general manager two days ago, and we were having this discussion, and he posed an interesting question, which was, write down if you write down on a sheet of paper, uh, you know, how many dominant edge rushers are there in the NFL? You go pretty deep on that of really impactful dominant edge rushes. And now write the impactful dominant defensive tackles. And you'll come up with seven or eight, and then that's mm. that's about it. So if you've got a chance to get one who you think can be one of those guys, A, there's value. Look at the look what these guys are making. Look what Christian Wilkins, look at all these guys that got paid uh in the offseason, the value of that position for those types of guys. Um, and it was his argument was like why would Byron Murphy not go ahead of these edge rushers? Mm, like I, they're similar type players and he's a heck of a lot harder to find. I guess like from an esoteric angle, like why, like, is this just a, a one year type thing? Like why is there such a dearth of defensive talent? It feels like that there'd be a, a similar amount each yeah. year. Nah, it's just ebbs and flows. I yeah. mean, like last year's tight end class was the best that I'd seen in 20 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd never seen anything like that this year. It's not very good. Um, so it's just, you know, it, it's how you hit it. It's just how it falls. The only thing that we're going to see consistently is there'll be, you know, there'll be receivers every year. 
no matter what. There will always be receivers. All right, what if I took you um, your Byron Murphy take, uh, but, yeah. I re- but I replaced it with Johnny Newton? Johnny Newton's my guy. I mean, okay. I, I don't know. I'm not, I, I guess explain to me why he's not like a potential top 10 pick because he, he is a guy that, I, that you watch and it's like he wins every snap. It seems like, and the, a, more, the, more I, the more you watch, it's just like he wins and wins and wins and wins and wins, and you can just see that working. Like, he seemed next level, and he, he seemed like a guy that was like, is this one of those guys teams aren't talking about because they all want to take him because they love him? Pro- probably, I don't know if that really happens. What, why, why wouldn't he be higher? Because he seems like a really exciting guy, along with Murph. Murphy's great, too. Yeah, he's a really good player. To me, like, if you told me that he was going to be a top 15 pick, I wouldn't I wouldn't bat mm-hmm. an eye on at that at all. And he's part of that discussion, and rightfully so to bring him up, that I think you'll see him get raised up. Now, in terms of like w- what I thought of him, like the concerns I had, I thought he was unbelievable with his hands. Like he has like it's like a car bomb goes off when he hits guys. He has got violent, <laughs> jolting hands. Doesn't that translate? That's awesome. It's really good. But you if you're not a force generator from the ground. That's a little more difficult against NFL players. So, in other words, if if you're generating, if you're if you're twisting guys and torquing guys and turning guys in college, you can do that a lot easier mm. than it is to do that against a 28 year old man up here. If you're gonna beat, if you're gonna beat really good NFL offensive linemen, you have to beat them with leverage and roll your hips and have your legs underneath you and win from kind of the floor up, not just the hands. Um, so that to me is, is, you know, one of the reasons why there was a separation there with him and Murphy. I know it comes as no surprise to you that Greg and I, um, we've kind of cornered the market when it comes to studying offensive linemen, what they should be doing on the field, <laughs> how they react, the physical nature of it. But um, I found it interesting. You said that executives kept mentioning to you over and over Graham Barton for his versatility plays all yeah. five. Like that, this guy sounds like he could go anywhere and be of immediate service. Well, he's played, he's played center as a 17 year old freshman at Duke and played it well. And then he's played left tackle. If you can play center and left tackle, you can play left and right guard. So you're a five position flex guy and he's incredibly intelligent. Um, so it's, it, he's one of those guys who he's good on tape at, at tackle, but you're like, he's not, that's not, probably his best position. He's going to be better served to get inside at center. But the tape is good. So you get good tape. Then the testing was outstanding. He had a great workout. And then, as you can imagine, when you have those two things going for you and you're Duke-level smart, you get in and meet with these teams, so many of which, which I think is a big theme in this draft, and I think you know, it's something to keep an eye on going forward, is this league is so full of young starting quarterbacks – and we're going to add a handful more this year. So teams are trying to do everything they can to serve those young quarterbacks. Mm. Having a freaking genius center um, that he can play with for a long extended period of time is a nice quality to have. That almost sounds like uh, Landon Dickerson coming out. Other than I know people were concerned with the injuries, but just like that, that yeah. was one you were, you were very high on. to give you your props coming in, and that was absolutely right. He's turned into a bargain. They just gave him. Uh, a ton of, ton of money. That actually makes me think, uh, do you have some, what are some picks or maybe just one, like one, yeah. one uh, selection over the years, take one of your guys that you're like, act, that you're proud of, that you, you want to stick your chest out and then to, ba- to balance it out, one that you uh, wish you had balance. Oh, a whiff, gosh. a whiff, See, a major whiff. I can think whiff. of 50 whiffs. <laughs> the hits Why? never. Why? Because you just the, don't, because you remember them better, you mean? Yeah, oh, yeah, because yeah, you're just like, oh gosh. Uh, but I mean, the the hits never make their way to the front of your brain. Those <laughs> right. are always like lodged somewhere in the in the back of your brain. I always just do the fallback with Kelsey because that was an you know that was a fun one. But I mean, mm. that that's like the greatest example of scouting to me of what scouting is is that you're gonna come out. Okay, you really want to come out to the front of the stage as as one of the people who evaluated Jason Kelsey, and we took him. Uh, what was he the sixth round and he's going to go into the hall of fame and you know one of the best centers of all time you want to beat your chest on that or do you want to remind everybody that we took danny watkins in the first round of that same draft <laughs> so, well that that's like uh, i think scott pioli used scouting. to keep uh keep in his on his office there were some guys some tight end stakowski i believe they took a round in front of tom brady so he always kept that framed <laughs> on his desk as a reminder of like you're, you're not as smart as as you think uh, yeah no but like you know the fun ones like Geno Stone, I, I could not 
when I, he, I was watching him coming out and mm. I, I went back and I was watching some of the old draft stuff. And that was my comment when he got picked. I'm like, I didn't, I don't understand it. Like I, I gave him like a, it was like a third round grade. And I would talk, all I do is talk to GMs and buddies around the league. And I'm like, nobody liked the guy. And I'm like, what am I missing? Like, he's mm. just a good player. He gets his hands on the football. He's super instinctive, smart, tough. Um, and then the Ravens, I think took him in like the sixth or seventh round. Uh, and I think he just got paid a, a nice chunk of money in, in free agency. He's been a really, really good player. So those are the those are kind of the fun ones, but then for every one of those, there's ten where you're like, oh man, like I mean, look, like I didn't like, Traylon Burks. I thought was a really good player. I didn't necessarily think he, you know, he was going to be mm. an All Pro, but I thought he'd be doing more than he's doing now. Uh, we'll let you go in a minute here. I, I well, there's so much wide receiver talk, but there's one guy, and I know that he had like concerns with whether it's off the field or what happened on the field after a game, but yeah. Jermaine Burton from Alabama, like watching him, I know because of all that other stuff, maybe some teams don't even have him on their board, but I, I loved what I saw. Like, is it, is this person like draftable or is it going to be, I, what, what happens? What's the destiny here? Uh, there's a lot of ability there. Um, yeah, no, I mean, look, everybody's, it's all different, right? Everybody has their things. I don't ever jump into that stuff. There's no win for me in doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just say he's he's got a lot of ability, but that's why there's a little bit of a challenge in terms of the stuff you learn, you know, talking to everybody and doing all the homework versus the pure, like in some ways, Mark, like what you're doing is just the pure scouting, you know, like this would be an example of that, him that's Mark in of a nutshell, having, pure scout. Because we did it. Remember you asked me about George Pickens, the Ooh. George Pickens year, yep. Greg did. Yeah. Greg's like, what am I missing? This guy's a freak. And yeah. I'm like, I, I know it's not that the, the tape is great. Yeah. But everybody's got to figure out all the other stuff. And it's you sort know? of uh, well, Pickens is he's kind of born out on both sides of like, yeah, yeah. The, the talent is <laughs> off the charts, but there's there's some headache there. What's yeah. uh, so I mean, that that's what I'm getting to, Mark. And that's yeah. why, like, when you're in the draft room, this is the discussion that takes place where the area scout who went into the school, got all the information, he might have a lower grade on a player. And then they'll give cross-check assignments, and the guy in a, in the southeast or you know other part of the country is going to watch the same player, and he's like, well, this area scout's an idiot. Like This guy's much better than that. And it's like, yeah, well, you're just doing the pure football evaluation, and he's doing the whole the whole picture. you know. So then you have to have that discussion. That yeah, makes sense. Mm. Who's uh, – and, and yeah, I know, I know you got Mina Kimes later on Move the Sticks. Everyone should check that out. Uh, you've probably got a million things. Today. We did a home and home. We did a little uh, one nice. on her podcast. She's coming on Move the Sticks. That's it's nice. a nice trade. Everyone wins. It's the ESPN crossover. Does she also have the same rule that she doesn't come on unless Dan's not on no, your show? Like, how no, does no. She has um, engaged yeah. with Dan on the show. Yeah, many times, many times. Really? Yeah. So he he wasn't supposed to be there and showed up anyway. She doesn't have a 10-year uh, grudge match, uh, whether it's real or fake, uh, with, with Dan. I think so. it really is. It might really be <laughs> 10 is, years. I think it is. <laughs> it is. It is. Do you remember what the first iteration of that beast No, was? it goes back to, like, ancient Greece. I'm, it's like, it's it's deep ancestry. Do you? Yeah, the, it's, I think this, I, it's the wholesome assassin. I think I made fun of him for dressing like a, a, a Uber driver, a limo driver, or something <laughs> on the very first episode. That's the wholesome assassin. About Jeremiah. And now I'm uh, <laughs> now I'm Fonzie. All right, last last football one for you is we yeah. just haven't talked running backs. Like, do, who who do you like? Who who's your favorite running back in this class? You think's gonna step in and, and do some fantasy damage, maybe? Yeah, I, I like Marshawn Lloyd from SC. Um, he's like got the perfect running back body. He's 5'8", 220 pounds. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. He's not bad as a pass protector. So to me, mm. um, I'm a fan of his. I like Ray Davis from Kentucky, another one who's like 215, sturdy guy. And then uh, just in terms of like two guys, I think they're going to have a role and catch balls next year. Bucky Irving um, can really catch it out of the backfield from Oregon, who like kind of gives me a little Devin Singletary vibes uh, coming out of college. Uh, so that would be one. And then uh, Dylan Lowby, who might, he might not even get drafted. He'd be a sixth, seventh round pick, maybe even a free agent, but the kid out of New Hampshire, he caught a bazillion balls. So like, to me, I don't think it's a great running back year, but you got a couple interesting guys who can kind of be more feature backs. And then, um, after that, those are a couple guys. that will be kind of third down guys, catch the ball a little bit. That's why I like uh, DJ, even though sort of, uh, on some level you're and you know, this, your, your prospects list set the tone in some ways for the rest of the uh, draft Nick industrial complex out there. Like your, your prospect list has 
real impact. Uh, but you ask them about the running backs, like that's way off uh, a lot of those consensus boards, and I like that DJ's thinking. There, yeah, himself. you know, I was talk- I talked to uh, someone last night, and we just we got to running backs, and it's like his top three running backs would be like my 11th, 12th, and 13th mm. running backs. Like it's just a weird year well, for that group. Hmm. All right, Daniel Jeremiah, um, it's your week. It's your time of year. I'm looking forward to uh, watching you round one. You know, be be nice to uh, to the rest of the guys. Like, don't don't flex how much more you know than all of them. Uh, no, I'll tell you what, Mark. It's been great to be with you, buddy. <laughs> as always, um, as always. You're DJ. absolutely the best. Uh, I don't know anybody who has endured more. We talk about players like, can you overcome <laughs> adversity? And then, like, whatever's next for you in life, what you've endured, what you've been through. Yeah. Um. I think it. I think it just bodes well for your success. There's a. There's a grittiness. There's a callousness. <laughs> There's a uh, just having been literally refined through the fire um, <laughs> aspect to you and what your future holds. And I couldn't be more excited. Greg, we'll see you next time. Yeah, this is why your scouting abilities um, tower above any other humans that I can think of. Yeah, a lot of misses, though, too. Uh, DJ, thank you. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Thanks for, Have fun. Yeah, thanks for not hitting me with Herbert. I, I, that was in the no, no, I've kind of put a little... Uh, I'm waiting till we actually have just, I want to have Justin Herbert on the pod and ask him about that at some point. That's okay. my dream question. Yeah. All right. Well, let me know. Thanks. Thanks, DJ. Thank you. You guys. Bye. And yeah, uh, as Daniel mentioned, um, back in the day, I think he was a little lower on Herbert. Than then consensus. Were, other people I gave, were I like to give him the business of it because he's not, yeah, not well, you know. calling every game. Guy changed the franchise. Uh, we are going to take a quick break, a little different, uh, schedule than normal that we just like start right off the meat with, the uh, you know, a plus guest, Daniel Jeremiah. Uh, we will be back and we're going to actually bring in the audience, the listeners, and we're going to get some mailbag questions. The first take quick break. All right. Welcome back. You know, <laughs> can't beat the master. <laughs> Exciting times here. Uh, draft is only one week away. We'll have you covered all next week. We got the Mark Sessler mock draft coming up. It's going to be like the sixth or seventh annual. Where I think it is the sixth or seventh. And then, like, I know the gist in the past was I just, you know, throwing a couple darts to the wall. It's like I've been grinding the tape this time, Greg. No, I Mark's have, been, um, yeah. he's been doing it. And uh, we're, we're working on some, some extra uh, motivation, mm-hmm. some extra. Bells and whistles we're adding to the mock draft. So that'll be exciting. And then on uh, Thursday, of course, we'll recap round one. We'll have, we'll have another preview show as well. We'll do some sandwiches. Uh, but for now, we thought we would open up the mailbag and get your draft questions to just try to hit as many as we can before we go, Mark. So uh, if you're watching on YouTube, we'll, we'll fly the, the questions up. But the first one is from Daniel Hall. And uh, he asks, had the Panthers... Given the Bears the third overall pick instead of the first overall pick, do you think Justin Fields would be their starter for 2024? I, I find this interesting because it is a good reminder that, you know, the Bears, great moves last year. They did get lucky how bad the, the Panthers truly were. And you need, you need luck to, to build uh, a dynasty along the way. It's like, you know, the Chiefs needed Patrick Mahomes to fall that far to make the smart move to go, to go get him, and, and they're lucky. I... Don't think Fields would be their starter no matter what uh, if they had a top three pick. I, it, you chose the right number, number three. If they were further back, then I think it becomes more of a discussion. I tend to think they, they did not really see Justin Fields as a true difference maker and that Drake May, Jaden Daniels would also you know provide a, a window into a new future. I, I wrote down the same thing. I think it's, um, they made their evaluation on Justin Fields. And, and top three, I think they would have found something to like in, each one of those guys to move on from fields. Right. It seems clear to me. Every team's so different. It really sounds like based on everything we're hearing, more teams have Daniels too than may. And that there are some teams out there and who knows if the bears would have been one of these teams that agree with the Chris Sims and the JTO Sullivan's of the world. And like some people just aren't in on may. They're just like, nah. Right. And I'm surprised by that. Cause to me, he's a, he's as exciting and maybe as good as any prospect I can remember watching since like Andrew Luck, along with Caleb Williams, who's even better. So it's crazy. There's two of these guys, but just in terms of pure excitement level and talent, he seems to be at that level, but some teams aren't into it. Uh, There are three really good quarterbacks in this class though. So yeah, I I think 
they uh, would not be keeping fields. Next question is from Patty, 710 on Twitter. Could you pass on to Mark Sessler that I was watching Winnie the Pooh with my daughters and Rabbit uses the phrase heavens to Betsy, so he is in good company. More of a comment than a question, but I liked it. Yeah, I think I've I've mentioned before multiple times that it was my grandmother that used to say this in various situations when flustered or something was seemed surprising. To yeah, so it, I, maybe she caught it from Winnie the Pooh's friend Rabbit. I'm not sure. It's always just a, a trip back in time uh, <laughs> on the Around the NFL podcast whenever that comes up. Next one is from Tom Marshall, longtime listener. Recognize Tom. Uh, serious question. Could Justin Jefferson be traded at the draft? He also says, unserious question, is Mahomes really nowhere near goat status. Let's start unserious first. We didn't say that. He's nowhere. Who would have said that? Yeah, I I think he's responding to our conversation on Wednesday that it was like... His start, his pro start. Yeah, we were were saying, like, it's just hard to compare someone who's had an entire career. Like, if Mahomes' career ended this moment, yeah, his his peak was brilliant, but how do you compare that to guys like Montana or Brady, or or, uh, especially Manning that played so long? I don't know. It's hard. So guys could, who won three or four. It's MVPs. like a goat farm. There's a couple right. so that's, a number of goats. It's not that he's nowhere near. It's just like he's got to keep playing. And he'll get there. There's almost no question. The Jefferson question, I was glad someone asked this. I, I, I do think there's like a greater chance that Justin Jefferson is traded than probably public perception is out there. I would still be shocked. But you do have the recipes here for at least it being possible, which is really great quarterback prospects and uh the vikings being this motivated to try to go up like i would only trade justin jefferson if i'm going up to one then i would maybe think about it (laughs) but i wouldn't think about it if i'm the the vikings but he he is not as valuable making 30 million dollars a year or whatever it's going to cost 100 million dollars guaranteed as he is this moment on this rookie deal and that's what it's going to cost but I still think like it would be crazy for them to do it. I think it's like there's this assumption because they've got the two number ones that they have everything they need to move up. But if teams aren't going to play ball with those those picks and they want if if it's you you we need Justin Jefferson to get up to two or three or whatever. Like I think the trend is you move on from some of these like massively starry wide receivers when the contracts become insane and you find like DJ said before like these players will not. Justin Jefferson, but great wide receivers will be available in every draft from now until the end of time. Mm. But yeah, Jefferson's so unique that Kwesi uh, Adolfo Mensa, th- their GM's comment that like, we're ready to make him the highest paid player in the league to me, that just said they, they know what they have. And I, I don't think there's almost any chance, but if you, I, if I'm individually looking at Ayuk and Jefferson and you want to throw some surprise T Higgins and some surprise names out there, like a, like an AJ Brown or a Devontae. like individually, I don't think any of them are close to likely, but odds, you know, the history would say like, there'll be one surprise out there. I think I to the Steelers. There's a little buzz and whispers around that. So we'll see. Next one is from Eric Blazell. Who would be your dream non NFL figure to announce a draft pick for your favorite or any franchise. All right, you, you go ahead. I came up with a quick list. Um, oh, I like this. Uh, Brad and Leo. This is for my, let's just like for my pick. Like this is who I, like it's my team. Your guys. That, so they would be one. Um, well, what about Leo uh, potentially playing Frank Sinatra in an upcoming biopic? biopic? Did you see that? I did. I, I don't see the resemblance, but um, I don't know. But why not? Well, you don't have to look exactly like. No, him. no. I mean, I like I liked I like him in anything Both have for the most part. Gauze, yeah. yeah, I think he could pull it off. Um, uh, so I have them. I have Chelsea Clinton. Jennifer Lawrence would play his his second wife, I believe, in that movie. She's too old for tough him. luck for in, the first wife in real life. Yeah, I have Chelsea Clinton dressed dressed in a suit of medieval armor. Um, <laughs> King Kong Bundy, although King Kong Bundy that was this would make news because King Kong Bundy died in 2019, mm. so he'd be back from the dead. Um, Dana Carvey announcing the pick as Ross Perot. That would be nice. <laughs> An AI version of Julius Caesar or Raggedy Ann and Andy. Those are all amazing. I can't top that. That when you get to day three, though, they had they they have animals announcing the picks and stuff. Sure. So it my, does get bizarre. my and my just first instinct was Nicolas Cage. <laughs> oh, yeah. I I just love him, and I just feel like I don't know what he's gonna do. That's the whole beauty of Nicolas yeah, Cage. Yeah, I just feel like he will own the moment. Our next one's from our friend Matt Tanton. Had some barbecue with him in Austin. Uh, he's a big time Bears fan. He addresses this directly to Tugboat. I'm going to take that as a slight, but you know, Dan did send out <laughs> the prompt. Uh, is the world prepared for the Bears to have an actual legit QB 
if Caleb Williams is as generational as us Bears fans hope, pray, believe he'll be. My my answer to this is, are the Bears prepared? Hmm. The world's prepared. The, world, the world's not thinking about the Bears. We're excited about new quarterbacks coming into the league. Right. I think he's going to be fantastic. Not like I guess I needed to do this, but just watch it. It's just like, I just can't see how it's not going to work. I just can't see how he's not going to be. And now generational is one thing, but if like Trevor Lawrence level, like you're in the top 10 quarterbacks in the league is the floor. And I'd be surprised if he's you know, like long-term, I just can't imagine him not being higher than that. Like we're ready. It's fine. It's another great quarterback. We love quarterbacks. Are the bears ready? Because they have been a somewhat unserious franchise for a long time in terms of their offense and people are like, Oh, they're, they're in great position. Now it's like, I, I guess like it's a new offensive system that bringing in. I like Shane Waldron. Fine. It, it, I like Keenan Allen, but they don't really have a number three and you know, he's had his injuries and stuff. The offensive line. It's like, okay, it's a new offensive system. Are they ready? Well, is, is Matt Eberflus ready? Is the GM and ownership Already, I'm not that I'm. I won't. I'd wait say especially see. if at number nine they get one of these like top wideouts. I I've talked to Tanton dating back like a decade plus in our newsroom about the Bears, and he's frustrated from the top of the heap all the way down with how the whole place is run. And I get it, but they, even under Levy Smith and even previous to that, they always had these like 13 and three seasons with no quarterback, where it was like it was always defense in the same you know Erlocker and like a great secondary and stuff. It's like if they were quarterback led. And the Bears had like a top two or three guy. I think from a fan angle, having watched football for like 40 years, that is something that I'm not totally prepared for in the sense mm. that they have been sort of the same thing forever. And if not milk toast, sort of the weird, wrong type of good team when they've been gone to the playoffs. This, is, this would be different. Right. And are we ready for the fans? Because they are among the best fans in the league. It would be great yeah. for the NFL. They have been irrationally optimistic about their team on an annual basis. Adam rank here at the NFL, I think represents that well and been so wrong so many times that when they actually have a, a real quarterback and a good team, I mean, they're going to get wild and I love it. It's a great sports town was reminded of that watching the, uh, the nine, 10 playoff play in game. I don't know if you were in on bulls Hawks. It wasn't much of a game, but I that, didn't plug that, into that. That crowd was insane for a night. You know, like the bulls fans, it makes sense. They, yeah. they just want a winner. And this team's been, sub mediocre forever they're 10 games under 500 but they're going freaking crazy because they you know they want a winner football that's, is completely different than basketball it's true and well, that, in this it, case i think it's it is the same great it's, it's similar the same, s- similar and thing. yet it's a bears town for all those titles everyone in chicago will tell you it's still bears and everything mm, i thought bulls would have put that to the test for a, for a long, while long well, period of time there. <laughs> um had a question this was the most common question this one's from mo design things but we got it about seven or eight times uh it asked, will there be an ATN draft show? Quite enjoyed last year. Unfortunately, there, there won't be. So we, we had to mention it at some point. Uh, we're Advice, just, rewatch last year's. That still exists. That would be great. It's got 2 million views on YouTube, which is wild. Um, but don't have enough resources to do it. So we're very disappointed and would love to bring it back. Not happening this year. Next question is, what do the heroes think is the most Chris Wesseling type prospect of the draft. Mm. And look, I just want any reason to, uh, to mention Chris on the show. And it got me thinking, actually, what is that even, what, what, what is a Chris Wesseling type prospect prospect? I came up with, I remember how much Wesleyan loved the physical nature of Steve Smith. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying they're the same player, but Roman Dunze to me was mm. like someone that I think Chris would have been like, I Ice get, up, son. Ice up. I get Marvin Harris and all of a sudden it's like, no one's looking past that. But like, Rome, to me, is this kind of guy that's going to come in and be a nasty physical player, and I think Wes always appreciated that. That is a perfect pick. You're absolutely right. That was his style. Uh, an Anquan Bolden type, who I yes. love, too. But Wes was unpredictable on some level in that, like, he liked what he liked, and that was what, uh, like, quarterbacks, he could be all, you know, he loved Mariota, but he also loved, like, big physical guys like Herbert. Um, so I thought Drake, Drake May, to me, popped up I felt like, you know, that's when I think we would have like agreed on that. Just watching someone do things. And I I think may could be like this in terms of the throws that he makes, do things that you just haven't seen guys do before that. He loved, he he loved a running back that could just pop a big play. When I was thinking about what, what does he like running back? Like he likes the ones that are physical. Certainly. I don't know this class well enough, but Trey Benson is that guy who can just pop the big play. Like Wes was 
early on on Jonathan Taylor really thought he'd be great and loved Ingram, loved Chris when, Johnson. When Ingram was healthy. right, so that's yep. the thing. Different yep. types of players. He likes the physical type, but he likes the big playmakers. It's about me. <laughs> it always is. And uh, yeah, if uh, you want to check my Twitter account this week, I sent out randomly this what Wes saw as his football syllabus. It was just a Excel spreadsheet, essentially, of all the books that he believes would be a great. I know you're not active right now on Twitter, so you. Well, I have a copy this. of this, though. Like, right. Yeah. I, right. I, I, and yeah. he had sent it out. Yeah. We have copies. So it, it. But just randomly, I clicked on it this week, and I, I and I thought, oh, that would be cool to send send that out, and people really like seeing it, and it's just got all the best football books of all time category categorized in a million ways. Mm. Long his best long forms. He really spent a lot of the time. The first time he was sick, going through all these long forms, that was like a project for him. Those sports long forms, non-sports, it's really great. Check check that out on um, on my Twitter account if you want this week. Next one is from Bradley Sadler, who says, uh, "Who has a better chance of drafting a first round QB, Rams, Jets, or Seahawks?" Uh, you know, it's interesting because I was going to bring this up with DJ, and you know, we moved on. But the he and Bucky had a conversation about the fact that. The Seahawks could be a very good destination for Michael Penix Jr. That they are, mm. you know, they've got people in the building. They're, they're the guy running their offense is a Penix. He he he's a he's a tutor of Penix. Um, they're up in the Northwest. They know Penix knows how to play in that in that world in that weather. And it's someone that you could kind of nestle behind Geno Smith and Sam Howell for a season, which makes sense for him. But it's like the arm talent and what they have. It's like I think they should look forward. To the quarterback. The thing is this, though, because they have a, they've got their first round pick, but they don't have a second, I believe, and so they'd mm. have to like figure out if they even wanted to package picks and trade right? up. I thought they, I think they do I not. I think have they a maybe second. sold. I think they got rid of one of theirs, but they had, they got rid of the, they lost one in the Leonard Williams trade, but I think they had one from the Broncos. So I think it even, even out. I'm looking at at Seahawks.com, and it's round one. Round well, three, an idiot. two fourths, two six, and a seventh. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I, I guess it would be, it would be that's kind of your draft right there, and it would be not their number one need at the moment. But um, I'd say that over the Jets. To me, it's like, why are we, we first round Jets? Like they, Aaron Rodgers is telling him he wants to play multiple years. Rams, that's a little spicy. Depends who would fall to him or, or what they would do. Yeah, I thought, and you're right. There is no second round pick. That was a, a brain fart by me. I thought it was an interesting question because we haven't heard quarterbacks associated really with any of these teams and yet they're all strong surprise teams the Rams have to start thinking about the post Matthew Stafford world first round would be a surprise but if the right guy fell to them or or, or second round I, I kind of opened this up in my head as like okay but maybe what about a surprise second round pick if the right guy fell like if, if Penix falls uh the Jets it's not crazy to think about that we had another question that but was first like, round though not first round probably yeah. the, in Someone said, well, should the that would just be a new, the Jets do a the new Jordan, story, though. Should the Jets do the Jordan Love thing? It did motivate <laughs> Aaron Rodgers to winning two uh, MVP awards. And then the Seahawks, it's almost weird how little connection there's been made that, like, the Washington offensive coordinator is their offensive right. coordinator. Penix picked the right year to come out with that. So he's there. And then he also has a close relationship and I think, you know, played with, played for Antonio Pierce. And those are two teams that, might be drafting quarterbacks. I don't think it's going to be a priority for Seattle in round one, but round round two maybe. Never know. Um, man, I hope, I hope not. That'll just be like a lot of drama. <laughs> Next question is um, really for you. It's from Sam Brown. He says, please, can you just give Mark three minutes uninterrupted to talk about what he was doing in the year 1997? I'm excited. Well, I don't think so. I hope this won't take three minutes, but I came up with a, a bulleted list. I had to go through the memory banks on this one. Um, and here it goes. Completed an internship at Baseball Weekly in Washington, D.C., top of the year. Bypassed a low-level newspaper job, moved to New York City, and lived in a West 108th apartment with my friend and a female painter. My room, my room had a mattress, three changes of clothing, and a typewriter. Dated a girl for a month who was very severe, wore librarian's glasses, and gave me pink eye. Ah! Worked as an, as an assistant <laughs> at a private investigator's office. I was asked to investigate copyright infringement, mainly like little companies calling themselves things like Costco 2 on these calls. I used an AKA Drew Corbett and would compile a case to bust their asses. Then left New York City to take a job at Camp Jewel, that camp happiness place is what you guys call it. Um, 
along with a female counselor named Amy, took a gaggle of youths on a week-long hike through the woods where it rained on us for three days. When <laughs> summer camp ended, I stayed at the camp and went on a 21-day water fast, where on days 18 and 19, tapeworms came out of my body. Um, moved to Boston for a gross. month and did it. It is gross. Moved to Boston, but, but it was helpful. Moved to Boston for a month and did a 10-day sleep study for $900. You'd stay awake for 72 hours in a row, as an example. Had a spiritual had spiritual visions by the end. Got on the Greyhound bus and moved to Boulder, Colorado. Found a farmhouse for $1,200 a month with my friend Kristen Bowles and waited for five friends and housemates to come west. Watched football for nine plus hours on Sundays at a bar <laughs> called Barrel House Two. Brett Favre was the center of my world. No Browns back then. Uh, worked at a string of 10 to 12 temp jobs, including putting together miniature flashlights at a flashlight factory. I was fired. And did you fit that all in one year? Yeah. Well, it was a transitory year, though. I don't know how that person knew to pick that year. Other years would have been less movement oriented. So. That was a perfect year to pick. Yeah. So what? That you must have been just out of college. So that was. a perfect Yes. Year yeah. Them. With no. Uh, no money. That was no a lot money. of different employment. Yeah, like I, I um, when I was here. trying to get a real job, I had a friend, like a some sort of industry expert, look at my resume and said, like, you look like someone who's just sort of on the run from the law. So, tapeworms, not what you want. Walker had some, like they literally could like see him look like worms. His, his poop. Yeah, that's where they. That's ago. where they appear. Disgusting. Outside of the body. Next question is, um, and I love that. That that is our social clip, Brandy. Um, <laughs> Dan of the Avenue asks, can you ask Greg which order would he draft the three members of Boy Genius in? Um, well, I'm not gonna do it for football because that just gets weird. Uh, but Julie, it's it's a clear one, two, three here with big tears in between. So it's Julian Baker first, Lucy Dacus second, Phoebe Bridgers third. Uh, next one is from Pulled Alpha. It's just obvious. Uh, any words of advice for a very near future first time dad? My immediate thought was would be like, don't worry. And I guess this would apply to you, Eric, as well, is um, don't stress or plan too much before they get there. Seems like a waste of time. Mm, yeah. that, like, enjoy that. Not like you have to, like, desert your... Um, your lovely wife, you, you should be supporting her and helping her in any way, obviously, while she's pregnant. But like, all, I, I see a lot of times people like, well, I got to plan this. I got to do this. I got to come up. And come. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's all going to be meaningless anyway. So you might as well just like enjoy, enjoy the time before. It's right. a little bit of a calm before the storm. Yeah, I, I really agree with that. Um, I, I think in general for a dad, one-on-one uh, -on -one time is very valuable no matter what you're doing. But the second thing I thought of was like with a with, child, with a child. Yeah. With um, our firstborn, Luke, like I had I was home four days a week, like during because I was working at NFL, but it was only three days a week. And like I literally was like taking care of him as a newborn for like hours a day. And it formed this incredible bond. So I know a lot sometimes dads like out on all that until like until the baby can talk or the child can like interact. It's like. Get in there early and, and like be part of that because it really creates something that I never expected. So there you go, Eric. Right. I'm actually pretty excited. I, I don't know. I, I mean, obviously, I'm pretty excited I'm having a son. But like, I'm really like gung-ho. I've had weird radio hours before. So like, I feel like I've been primed and mm. nurtured to have be up at 2 a.m. every two hours through the night. So like, I'm actually kind of excited about like being... My wife has done enough. Like I'm, I'm going to be like okay. ready to go and take, take over whenever needed. So Good messaging. Five okay. weeks out. That's exciting. And uh, although I do find it, I feel like this happens for a lot of couples that they realize with the second kid, it's like, well, we don't both have to get up every time. No. <laughs> second oh, kid my, is getting My wife jobbed. has made that clear that there, there will be a, 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 a period of time where I am the overnight guy. So I'm like, sure, oh, that's fine with me. Sure, the, but the key being like, either she's the overnight woman that night or in general that week or whatever it is. And, yeah, you know, it doesn't have to be the same person don't every day. Don't tug on each other You, right don't, you don't need to be like, oh, come, you know, you're, you're getting, it's like do one or the right. other. You want the other stronger right. in the day. Also, yeah. uh, people don't know this, but every human child is dramatically different. And so these like base sort of yeah. like recommendations for what to do and how to think like 
no. you know, it doesn't exactly work because every child reacts completely different. Look at the Wesleyan brothers. Right. My, even my two children, one advice for one would have been terrible advice for the other and, and vice versa. Right. Well, we'll get through this first one before I got to worry about right. trends. And, I'm just, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying they're all different. Seems like a fair plan. Jeff Yates, what would uh, in your mind be the most polarizing pick your team of fandom could make this year? Oh, I didn't read this right the first time. Well, for me, it would be the Patriots trading down. And just doing that. Like yeah. that, that no matter who's on the board, whether it's May or Daniels. And I would be personally more into it if it was if May is gone and Daniels is on the board and they traded down to like the Giants and they still get one of the receivers. To me, I'm gonna I'm gonna ride with that and just see what happens. But that would be the most polarizing. Everyone wants the QB. I think so. If I'm coming from a Browns angle, like they don't they don't pick till the fifty fourth pick. And so I kind of was like, I mean, quarterback's stupid just because they're not going to take a quarterback at no. 54. But, like, I thought the one thought, like, this, the, heart, the beating heart of the Browns is Nick Chubb, but there's questions about his health still and where it'll be and, like, his future to some degree in terms of, like, what is this player post-injury? Like, if they went and picked at, at 54, it could work. Like, a starting-type running back, I think that would yeah, cause some problems with certain Browns fans. Yeah, that wouldn't, that wouldn't make sense. The thing is, like, everyone loves all these offensive players and like none of the tackles are are going to be polarizing it it's always a team that just looks at their board differently than the rest of the league it's often been the seahawks lately it used to be the patriots often where it's just like they take a guy who's on the consensus board at like 43 except they take him at 16 and everyone goes crazy but it's like you don't know anything finlay mcclure which you know sounds suspicious is that a made-up name, Finlay McClure? <laughs> I think it possibly is from overseas. Possibly. I don't know. Or it's a character from, like, DuckTales. If you are Sean Payton and the Broncos, which scenarios do you pick? Trade up to four, give up uh, three firsts to get McCarthy or May, stand pat at 12 and take Penix, or take best player available non-quarterback at 12 and build the team up first. Uh, of those three, I would go for the third option. But I, I like Don't the, take a quarterback. Yeah. Hmm. I just think reaching at 12 seems silly and I don't I wouldn't I wouldn't give up all those picks for for the third quarterback in this class even though I love May. I I think uh you stay at 12 and I think there's a real chance that Bo Nix is available at your second round pick or Michael Penix is available like all these guys aren't going to go like don't force it. I I'm with the don't force it but don't ignore a quarterback just because like this concept of we're going to build a team and wait for a quarter like if they go four and thirteen, you don't have time for that. Like no one has time for that. Don like, Payton might, of anyone, but yeah, I hear. It. I don't know. I feel like the the Payton thing like needs to work for like this invincibility shield around him to continue to be uh, accurate. And there's it's like the quarterback draft is going to allow someone to come down there. I but I I would do it. But if you're saying May is this potentially player that we've never seen before and he's sitting okay. there at three it's like then you then why would you not trade sure trade up but to like get four first or three first round picks sure but I, if he's that if he's that guy no who's no yeah that's it'll, fair. they'll look genius but that's, that's fair you don't know if the he patriots is, also would or whoever it would be would have to take that pick so you, you need two two teams to tango there other oh, elliot wolf the gm in in practice not in name uh for the patriots said on thursday we're open for business we're open for business uh, on pick three and everything else, but we're, we're open for business. So I think they'll be listening. What's your favorite me draft memory? Asks uh, Brandon Smith. What draft pick are your favorite team? Were you most excited about at the time of the pick? What player uh, most surprised by turning into uh, a bust? <laughs> what do you got? I mean, I know my, mine happened on this show and like, uh, there's a clip that I wish wasn't out there to some degree. Yeah. When the Browns did this. With the 22nd pick in the 2014 NFL Draft, the Cleveland Browns select Johnny Menzel. Quarterback, Texas a &M. That was Dave Damashek. I mean, we were shoved into those Radio City musical seats, which were made for people in the 1910s. And, uh, you know, I had walked around like Manhattan for days, kind of wishing this would happen. And when it happened, it felt like 
Cleveland is the most exciting thing in the National Football League, and then it went completely, completely, totally south into hell. It's pretty rough. I mean, you look um, younger there, but I think you look better now, so that was nice. Everyone should check oh, that out on, on YouTube. Thanks. That uh, was Dave Damashek's voice you heard. <laughs> and just like uh, you can't really put words to Mark's expression there. I read this question wrong and, and just thought like general draft moments. I'm trying to think of the Patriots player I was most excited about. It, weirdly, Will Fork fell so far to them and seemed like such a Patriots guy, and that was about the peak of like Patriots always make the right picks it, fandom for me that I just remember being so pumped when Vince Wilfork yeah. fell to them at the time. Uh, but otherwise, you know, when, when the Vikings didn't take their pick and the other two like ran up to take it in 03, that was just like an incredible draft. Yes, moment, that was wild. Like, what am I watching? The 04 draft to me, nothing will top Rivers, Big Ben, Eli Manning. There was a lot of stuff going into the draft, but literally as it happened, we all thought they were going to trade and make the trade ultimately that they did make, but no one knew for sure. And then the Chargers take Eli and he has to hold it up. And we, there's there's not Twitter at that point. And so it's just like you're living in this total netherworld. It was like, wow, they really took him. They're putting the Giants' feet to the fire. Like, what the hell is going to happen? I guess they're just going to keep him. And, the, and he's holding it up and he's like not happy about right. it. And so <laughs> that like... 20, 30 minutes. It was 15 picks minutes per pick then before Rivers and the Eli trade actually happened. And that was just so ballsy by their GM who it's escaping me who that was. It was AJ, uh, AJ Smith, I believe was his name, who, who just sat there, took Eli and just waited until the best offer came in and they got a great one. And then they ended up getting Rivers. So they were both. I think happy. both those things you mentioned, the right. missed pick by the Vikings, um, and in that scenario right there, like they've never, that's never really happened since that way at all. So, yeah. That was incredible. The Ricky William, I was in New Orleans. That was crazy. I was in New Orleans for that draft. I was, that was when I was in college. That, that hasn't yeah. happened again either. So, no, that was uh, a wild thing. And that, that was a rare thing. I think I just wanted the weekend off. Right. In the yeah. post game, the press conference where he came and uh, showed up in Ricky's dread, wearing Ricky's dreads, it was just, uh, it was a different time. Uh, let's go to our next. We, oh yeah, you know I brought this one up last year's Greg hit on Sam Laporta. Uh, who is Greg's only fantasy sleeper superstar that uh, dynasty keeper managers need to keep their eye? On? I still I still want to watch some of these running backs. I can't pretend that I have a hot take, and that's usually the fantasy thing. Uh, but for me, it's Brian Thomas Jr. I just mm. I just love me some Brian Thomas Jr. Love him. Like I just think that. He could be up there with those three guys in the end as just this crazy, explosive year after year, big time wide receiver. Yeah, and Chad Ryder, who we had on yesterday, had him falling all the way down to the Bengals. Yeah, there's a lot of disagreement with him that he. Could but that would be an anywhere. incredible landing spot. That would be if he landed there, he would be a big time player sooner than later. Where uh, on the P scale, our next tweet asks, and I think this is the last one. How about that? We really cranked is Greg Rosenthal in terms of the P scale in regards to the Delaware tapes being released. Uh, I have an update on this situation. I was, I've been, <laughs> I'm going to go poop. <laughs> okay. No, that's not the update. <laughs> I I've been ready all week for this update, but Dan just hasn't brought it up. I don't feel like it'd be right to do without Dan here. So okay. uh, we'll save just, it. We'll just, we'll just, we'll just, you don't seem too unnerved by the whole situation. I'm fine. Okay. Fine. I'm proud. Um, that's it. Mark, what a week of shows. Next week, we're, we're on to the draft. That will be a bigger week than this week by leaps and bounds. It will, but it's just the adrenaline, the excitement carries you through. We'll be back on Monday, Eric Wright. And then uh, we'll also have the Mark Sessler mock draft. We'll be there on draft night. We'll wrap up the draft with winners and losers over the weekend. So I'm excited. The adrenaline kind of carries you through draft week. I'm ready for the pre-draft process to be over. Let's go. Uh, for Mark Sessler, Randy Chavez, Daniel Jeremiah, thanks for coming on. Eric, we miss you, Dan. Heed the call. <laughs> <laughs>